From the Washington, D.C. area, it's the inside scoop. All the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Hi, folks. My name is Cesar Del Aguila. Welcome to our show. This is Inside Scoop. We've got a great show planned today. And let me tell you, let's get started. Uh, we're going to be talking about immigration. We're going to be talking about voting restoration. And my first guest tonight is a great individual. I've known her for a little while, but I'm real excited that you all get to know her. Alexandra Dixon, my friend, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I want the viewers to get to know you a little bit. I know you. I was going to read this whole bio, but quite frankly, Tell us a little bit about yourself. What gets you up in the morning? What pumps you up? Why are you a grassroots activist? Okay, well, I'm a grassroots activist around immigration issues because mm -hmm. I'm an immigrant myself. I was mm -hmm. born in Bogota, Colombia in 1982, mm -hmm. and I was born with a disability called spina bifida. Mm -hmm. And when I was born, the doctors told my parents that I probably wouldn't live past age two, that if I did, I'd be mentally retarded and that I would never walk. Yeah. And it's really expensive to keep people like me alive in Colombia. So mm -hmm. they said, look, she's got an American father. Why don't you take her to the States? And so my parents said, okay, great. Where? And so the doctor said, Chicago, New York, DC, and there's a tiny little town in the West called Salt Lake City, Utah. And that's where my dad happened to be from. Wow. So okay. we went there. Um, and I was there until about age four. Um, mm -hmm. And my mom started getting some kind of negative stuff like, well, I'm not gonna let my child play with your child because your child's Latina and she's not LDS. And so my mom said, I'm not raising my child in this environment. Wow. Wow. So then we came to the DC area and I've been in the DC area ever since I was four. Excellent, excellent. Now, again, I'm an immigrant as well as mm -hmm. we all are. Mm -hmm. uh, it's how many generations, quite frankly, back can people count? Mm -hmm. uh, the thing I find fascinating about your story is, quite frankly, it's not atypical, mm -hmm. right? I mean, th there are some people, well, I, let me sta stand back. Some people don't have the luxuries or the opportunities or the choices that you and your family were, were able to exercise. And I, I know this is a passionate issue of yours. Mm -hmm. And I, I know, like so many others, um, you're not here to be a drain on the society. Right. right. I'm working a full-time job um, up in know. Maryland. Um, I'm definitely somebody who's beat the odds um, sure. as an immigrant, as a person with a disability. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do pay my taxes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, I am involved in the community and I do volunteer work and I do um, get in contact with the political system and make my voice heard and organize and that sort of thing. So Excellent. I think I am contributing to what makes America so great. The fabric and, that, and that's true with most immigrants and, and family members. Mm -hmm. um, what I've experienced is if you give someone a little bit of help, mm -hmm. and at whatever level, it's local, you know, state or national, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that pays off in dividends we can't measure. I mean, you, you measure it over a lifetime. But there, it's not like a business. There's not like a quarterly <laughs> report of return on investment. That's exactly right. Um, I actually am somebody who was on Medicaid for about four years after high school and okay. throughout college. Mm -hmm. And since graduating college, I've had a full-time job, you know, almost consistently. And so I haven't needed Medicaid since then. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm beating the odds in terms of being a drain on society in terms of that, that the immigrants are going to come and take all of our Medicaid dollars. Yeah, yeah, and, and which kind of like it's, it's bringing us a little bit forward today. Mm -hmm. Um, there's this hot debate mm -hmm. about immigration reform, yes, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. southern border, northern border, let's build walls. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, how does that feel to you? How do you hear that and, and respond? How does that make you kind of feel there? Sure. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated topic for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, Absolutely, we do need to be aware of security and security issues, but not just at the Mexico border, but also on our Canadian border. We do need to be aware of how to pay for certain things, um, you know, and that can be done either through the government or nonprofits, that sort of thing. Um, but the, the stuff about, for example, what's going on in our southern border of immigrants that they're going to come and they're going to steal our jobs. 
well, we pass very strict immigration laws um, and economies collapse. We've seen that in Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We saw in Prince William County where um, it was, I believe, 600,000 Latinos left Prince William County. And sure. it wasn't just Latino um, businesses that fell right. um, into deep recession. It was also American-owned businesses that fell into deep recession. No, right. um, the unintended consequences, right? I right. Mean, that, that's, uh, and the last time I checked, I, I didn't score high in geography, but Colombia wasn't on the Mexican border. Like people were, wa your family didn't walk across the border, correct? Right. Um, so. My mom did um, in the past get stuff. Oh, you're just a wetback coming here. Oh, yeah, okay. she did. <laughs> yeah, right. She did. And she's one of these um, women who is highly educated. She's got a PhD. She went to uh, an Ivy League university. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, she did get a lot of negativity in, in that sense. Um, in the case of Colombia, specifically what's going on is that we've had a civil war since so the 1960s right. or so. Um, and so there's actually been a brain drain where a lot of the immigrants who are coming from Colombia are your lawyers and your doctors and that sort of thing. And one of the things that I've seen is, yes, you're a doctor in Colombia, but once you get here to the States, you've lost everything. Right. And so you have to start from scratch. Yeah. So, Well, there seems, I mean, as an immigrant, I, I, and oh, our family, I mean, people that I know in my family and friends, a lot of them are immigrants, there seems to be this notion that if you are more Latino uh, based, you fit a certain tier within the society. Mm -hmm. And it's other immigrant groups, probably you know Asian, um, subcontinent, that are more doctorate, strategic business owners, where it seems Again, very general, mm -hmm. that the Latinos are more the operational, day-to-day, -day food service industry folks. And that's where they tend to put people, mm -hmm. those that want to qualify people and, and segment them. And that's just not the case. There, there are so many more doctors and lawyers that are Latino than people actually realize. Right, and in terms of other immigrant communities, it's putting a lot of pressure on them that mm -hmm. that's the expectation, that right. if you're coming from Asia or India, that you're gonna be the computer science person, that you're gonna be the doctor and, and that sort of thing. And so for me, it's about taking people as they are. You sure. know, yes, some people are gonna be doctors and some aren't, and they all have something to contribute sure. to this society. And there's a lot of folks waiting, quite frankly, yes. on the government. Um, you know, I'm, no secret, I'm a big Democrat, but I was a little disappointed they decided to kick that issue down, downstream till after the election. Um, I'm not putting words in your mouth. How did you feel about that? Yeah, I, I was disappointed too, um, but it just goes to show that um, particularly the Latino community needs to get up, get involved, get become citizens, get registered to vote, um, get informed, start talking to their friends and their family and their neighbors, um, and talking to their politicians and really engaging um, in ways where we may not have done that before because our history is that of violence. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, in Colombia we had what was called la violencia, where mm -hmm. Democrats and, or not Democrats, but liberals and conservatives have fought and so it turned people off from politics a lot mm -hmm. um that's definitely well, we had a civil war a few uh years back so but uh, definitely now my my story is a little bit like yours in that um for me i had directly a cousin that was affected mm -hmm. um he was deported mm -hmm. his 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 parents brought him here when he was a baby mm -hmm. and i mean his own fault he made some bad decisions and he was incarcerated and deported to a country he did not know as his home. Mm -hmm. And he's only known America. Mm -hmm. And that was a very, very difficult time for our family. Uh, I'm sure lots of other immigrants, both Latino and others, face something similar. So for me, I was really hoping the administration and Congress and the Senate would actually sit down and do something. But now we have to wait another election cycle and probably Wait some more. Your thoughts? 
I'm hoping that that President Obama stays true to his word and does something in the lame duck session of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that uh, that there's an executive order to do something about uh, immigration. And I know that particularly here in Fairfax County, we've absorbed a lot of the immigrant children from the border. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is something that our local politicians are having to deal with. And I'm hoping also that the state level that there's some kind of talking about what resources these children need and how can we best support them. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that's definitely something that we need to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to see it not just at the executive level of President Obama, but also in Congress and at the state and definitely the local level. What's the biggest disappointment uh, you have? I mean, I'll share with you mine mm -hmm. within the Latino community. What's your, what's your biggest disappointment to uh, maybe making this more, more visible within the community? Um, it's the stereotype that Latinos don't care. We mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's that um, it, it's when politicians say, "Well, you don't show up to vote, and mm -hmm. you don't show up to meetings." Mm -hmm. And so, I really have been working very hard to get all Latinos of all political stripes yeah. um, out to meetings to say, yes, we're here and this is important to us and you need to pay attention because we're going to be the largest minority mm -hmm. in the United States mm -hmm. very soon. And, you know, to start organizing around these issues. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you for me, um, similar, mm -hmm. it's, it's just frustrating. It seems that the elders um, within the community, uh, within the church groups, don't seem to trust the system depending on what country they come from. Uh, because we're dealing with a lot of third world countries, we're dealing with a lot of corruption. Uh, quite frankly, they're afraid of the police, they're afraid of elected officials, because in their mind, they're conditioned from, from their, home, you know, their homes that uh, everything's on the take. And that, to me, is the biggest challenge, I think, that we have to overcome. And quite frankly, to your point, this is a growing group of people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sooner or later, they're going to have to step up and realize that their voices need to be heard. Even if, like my grandma, um, never speaks English, can't anymore, but she never could speak English because she just stayed within her own group. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's something I'm sure you have seen or, or have heard about. So I actually have seen a lot of Latinos really trying to integrate into mm -hmm. the United States and into American society, trying to learn English. English is a hard language to learn. It's yeah. a language of immigrants. It's right. got German, it's got French, it's got old English, it's got just all this wonderful mixture and it represents who we are as a society and I think we definitely need to do some more support of helping people to learn English um, I think um, but I, I've definitely seen people really trying to do that. Well I tell you what that's going to be one of the things going forward certainly in Fairfax County certainly in Northern Virginia and quite frankly in the state. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the country is certainly going to have to uh, take it up. You're going to be back in our next section, folks. Uh, stay tuned, folks. We've got a lot coming up. Art, a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact C. Fripp at AOL.com. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. 
Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems, and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. Here again, the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Hi folks and welcome back. We're in our second segment here. I have a new guest and Leslie Shaw. I'd like to introduce you to the crew here and uh, also to our audience. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, thank you, Cesar. Uh, I'm Leslie Shaw. I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Greater Washington Immigration Film Festival. Uh, I'm a private consultant. I work with health care organizations. I spent uh, nearly 14 years with the federal government um, really making health disparities and, uh, and equality uh, a priority for the American health care system. Mm -hmm. uh, I left about, a, about six months ago to set up my own business, but I remain totally committed to a kind of um, just and equitable uh, health care system and really a kind of, and now with the immigration system, I think there's a real bridge there in terms of people use the healthcare system and healthcare is not uh, our disease and illness and you know people get sick, it happens and there's a kind of justice that, that needs to be done and um, we don't wanna lose people in our healthcare system, uh, sure. in, our, in our infrastructure and um, I, I see immigration as an opportunity uh, and immigration as an opportunity to, um, to, to welcome people and to create a, a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of recognize that people are people however they come to the United States. So I get, I get the sense that you're an equal That's kind right. of person, That's that right. everyone is, is equal, and you're probably not for a for-profit healthcare system, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the crux of what, what I heard you say. Um, I think that there's a role that the government plays in providing sure. health care to all people. Mm -hmm. I think there's, um, I think that people are people, uh, and um, creating a system, uh, creating a just system where, uh, where where the strengths of the people in a productive society is always our goal. Now, how long have you felt this way? I mean, it's not it's something like you woke up to or no. gradually over time. I mean, a little bit of background. Uh, what what brought you to sure. this view? So I'd like to think that I was I was born that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, my mother and my father. Um, my mother had early teachings in Quaker education as a young person. Uh, uh, she 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 passed those on to me. Um, At what point were your family? the immigrants at what point? So my mother, uh, I'm a fourth generation immigrant on my okay. mother's side and a, fifth, and a fourth or fifth generation on my father's side as well. Okay. Uh, but I think that we've always seen the human condition that, 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 that um, we've always seen the human condition as something that, we're, that we take responsibility for that whether you're black or white, Latino, whether you're um, disabled, able-bodied, at least temporarily able-bodied, uh, that for me as a young person, I worked in inter intergenerational council, I worked with elderly people, I was a youth counselor working with young people. Um, I've always seen um, relationships as interesting and dynamic, mm -hmm. and I value people from every, from every, from every background. It's, it makes, it's what makes the interesting colorful cloth of who we are. E pluribus unum. That's right. that's right. Yeah, that's great. What, um, any big disappointments along the way? Any big triumphs? Anything that uh, really you'd like to let the uh, audience know that uh, is unique to you in terms of your passions? Um, in terms of my own life, I think that if 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 we looked at if we looked at my life in a very limited perspective, mm -hmm. I think I think my life would have been very limited. Um, uh, I always realized that I, I had people that recognized my own potential, and I always strived to re I always strived to reach that potential. Mm -hmm. Whether it was eventually going back to college, whether it was, you know, graduating from from graduate school at Johns Hopkins, which I'm very proud of. It's a wonderful institution, mm -hmm. incredibly dynamic and diverse. Uh, working, I mean, at one, I, I remember my grandmother cried when I when I got into Hopkins. It was a considered an op awesome. it was a it was a change, and awesome. and it was more than you know. Oh, how what a, what a wonderful school! But it was. Leslie Shaw really doing something with her life in a way that um, she believed would would really better the human condition. Sure, that's incredible. That's great. Um, let's talk about immigration specifically. Sure. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, we uh, as a country kicked the can down the road. Yeah. Um, you've heard my view. I, mm -hmm. Give me your thoughts on uh, the sure. decision to uh, kick the can down the road till after the election. Frankly, I was disappointed. Okay, I was disappointed. Um, I feel I, I feel that 
our, our leadership is elected to make decisions. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> yep. I think that I, I think that um, I think too often our our our, um, our elected officials look in a magic mirror and have one, and have someone tell them how they look, how they behave, what to, what to do. And I, I think really what we have to do as um, as individuals who vote and as individuals who serve in in a, in a kind of capacity, a legal um, a, a law capacity, is that we don't need the magic mirror to tell us how wonderful or good or we are, how to vote or how to do things. I think it's our responsibility to vote our conscience. Novel, just, novel. <laughs> okay. I think it's I think that you know I think there are decisions that are popular and unpopular and I and I think that you know life is complicated and I think that we need people to sort of look inside themselves and ask themselves what is where are my priorities what's important you know what am I willing to stand for you know it's not you know my the the, the, the role of the elected official is not to stay elected it is their job to to, to speak you know in, in a capacity of leadership mm -hmm. and um, I think that too often we find people you know, pushing off a decision is still a decision. It's a decision not to act. In action, in yeah. action is still a decision. And sure. I, I'd really like to see. I, I think that these are tough problems, and I think um, I think it's our responsibility as leaders, and I, I'll use our responsibility because I have a responsibility as a voter. Um, and I think that the the, the 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 people we vote into office have a role and responsibility to to vote their conscience. And it will be unpopular at times, it will be popular at times. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, when they look in the mirror, it's them speaking for themselves. How do I look? I'm proud of my decision. I made a good decision. And I think that that's when people, that's when people walk away from the mirror knowing who they are. Yeah. Not because someone told them they did a good job, but because they know themselves. They've looked inside and they said, I made a decision that best reflects my values and the people that voted me into office. And again, some decisions are popular and some are not. You, you're describing integrity, mm -hmm. perhaps. That's right. Um, I, I, I agree. I mean, it, it's almost today, and that's part of the drawback with the system, sure. right? The elected officials, once they get elected, they probably only have a small window to actually get something done. That's right. And then guess what? It's election again. In but most I think cases. that that's why it's even more important. It's a mm -hmm. small window. It's a mm -hmm. small window to make systemic change. Mm -hmm. And your window is the, I mean you're in elected office. It's now or never because whether whether you're in elected office, whether you get hit by a car, life is short. Sure. Our opportunities are limited and we do what we can with the time we have. And and again, that means making a decision, you know, popular or unpopular, but voting with one, voting with one's conscience, whether it's voting in the ballot box or voting on the on the on the on the House or Senate floor, or ultimately signing something to legislation. That's you know, the window is small, and I think that we have an obligation. Okay, to so serve. we we agree unanimously. Mm -hmm. I think with the guests, they blew it. They should have done something. How did it affect you personally? I mean, what what was your, what was the ripple effect? Um, you know, in, in your life, in your family, uh, how did sure. how did this sort of translate? Sure, um, I guess there was a sort of a sadness. I mean, it it, mm -hmm. it seemed the status quo. Um, I mean, I, I I do accept that there are things that I don't fully that there's that, that, that I didn't like. I can't fully understand the situation. Mm -hmm. We have a small sliver of knowledge about how the work operates. That sliver of knowledge really generally comes from the perspective of self. And my, pers you know, my perspective of what happened was is that this was a um, this was a failure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and 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 will there be opportunities to fix it? I sincerely hope so. I think I think that the, the window is still open. I, I'd like to see some action taken sooner than later. Um, Are we focusing on the right things? I mean, I, I keep hearing, you know, I, I talk to my friends on the right, friends on the left. On the right, I keep hearing, well, we have to build that wall. On the southern border, mm -hmm. right? No one ever mentions the northern border. That's right. No one ever mentions some of the checks and balances sure. uh, during the, the ports or the mm -hmm. airports. And no one ever talks about how the heck we might pay for something like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an investment. Mm -hmm. When you start screening and, and checking everyone that comes, right. I mean, granted, right. we should enforce the borders. Right. But how do we do it? Right. And I think that uh, no one is really addressing the big problem sure. and that systematically, you know, sure. what does the infrastructure sure. look like? Sure. I mean, I, I think for a lot of people, it's kind of an emotional, yeah. you know, snag. Let, let's get right. these people fired up over That's controlling right. borders. Well, who doesn't want to control borders? I mean, we all do, but how do we do it, you know, in the details? Sure. And I just, for me, and that's what I was trying to get, get from you, like personally, it's affected me. Sure. And I like to hear the stories of people and, and I like, the viewers understand we all have these stories and sure. I'd love for them to share sure. and um, for me it's a frustrating thing as, as sure. you, you mentioned. Sure. 
I mean, in terms of how it touches my life personally or, 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 or what, what to do about it, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that I, I think that the immigration issue is not well understood. I think that we always talk about the problem as the southern border, right. but it's far more complicated yeah, than absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have problems with human trafficking. That's a small piece that we talk about, right. uh, or that's not talked about enough. Right. There's human trafficking issues. I think that we don't talk about sort of the way that the visa program works there for people who come here legally. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I talk about immigration reform, I'm talking about comprehensive immigration reform. Mm -hmm. The southern border is part of the problem are part of the challenge, we'll say, not part of the problem. These are humans, but these are, this is the challenge. Right. Um, but it's not limited to the southern border. Absolutely. You, know, you have people right. coming here, I mean, people who come here legally with certain types of visas, young people that come to the United States thinking they're gonna study one thing, and the visa system is limited to, to whatever, to, to what they, that they said they come in for. Mm -hmm. It's a small piece, but if we think about that, the role of an education is to create productive, a productive society, mm -hmm. you know, we want people to fulfill their dreams, whether it's the dream of, a, of, of, of opportunity in the United States to work uh, for health care, uh, for, for health care, whether, um, whether it's to study and to grow and to learn. I mean, we want to nurture the human condition. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. It's, it's recognizing that we each have a potential that needs to be reached. And let's be clear, uh, because I know my friends on the right will accuse me of encouraging people to be a drain on the society. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone is encouraged that. In fact, if you break the laws, you need to be punished. Mm -hmm. If you overstay a visa, you need to go back. Mm -hmm. You need to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that we do anything that encourages people to break our laws. That's right. What I think we're talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the comprehensive reform that addresses all the statuses, right. all the conditions, That's right. and really puts in place a process That's right. that people can go through. That's right. And, and, and you talked about how it touches me, like half my family is immigrants. Mm -hmm. I married into a family of immigrants. My husband's family is from India. My uncles, my aunts, um, they're all from India. And I love and value them. And the opportunity to, to grow and learn something more about immigration, to understand that, that it's a complex issue, to recognize that, you know, that when we talk about immigration reform, we're talking as much about how do we communicate the priorities of, 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 of this country to people who have come here legally and people who have not come here legally? And I, I think that's one of the challenges of immigration reform is that you know that we don't want to discourage, we don't want to encourage illegal immigration, but we want to understand that it's not as simple as the southern border. Right. It, and again, that's the simple answer. Right. If you want to fire up people, mm -hmm. and if you just want them to either make donations, that's the emotional hook. Right. Right. That's that's. Um, to me, that's cheap politics. That's right. And I think if you really want a true solution, it's gotta be a little bit broader. That's right. And guess what? It's complicated. That's right. There's no simple answers. That's right. I, I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit more. Uh, we'll probably pick it up in the next segment. Just sure. briefly, um, what's the percentage of mix in your family again? Immigrants, uh, non-immigrants, or? <laughs> um, well, if you included my husband, myself, and my children, that would be that'd be three quarters of us. I was okay. a fourth and fifth immigrant. Actually, the, well, I, I take that back. We're, um, we're all American citizens. Sure. My husband was, was a first-generation immigrant, um, but it's 50-50. I mean, 50% I, of my family, my, 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 my biological family, and then the other 50% of my family who I married into. I mean, we're 50-50. I'm, you're I'm part, I'm you're part an of American, community. as far as I can tell. Oh, yeah, right? I, that's right. <laughs> Good old American. We're all a bunch of immigrants. Yeah. Uh, folks, in the next section, Leslie's going to stay on, and uh, Alessandra is going to join us. We'll be right back. To smoke it before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about Rick Dark. Nothing very nice. On a homeless mind. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go! Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow! Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People! The flood is imminent! Is it too much to ask? 
for a little precipitation! Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. Here again, the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Folks, welcome back. Uh, we're rejoined here with Leslie and Alexandra. We're going to be talking about the Greater Washington Immigration Film Festival, correct? Yes, that's right. Now, we talked a little bit in the previous sections about you, your passions, but let's get into this. Help the audience understand what we're, uh, what we're going to be doing here. Okay, so I guess I'll start. Sure. Um, this came out of um, a, an organization called Unitarian Universalists for Social Justice. Mm -hmm. And what that is is a group of Unitarian Universalist churches throughout the DMV area. Um, and so we've been looking at immigration as um, a social justice issue for right. a while. Um, Unitarian Universalists went down to Arizona for our General Assembly and we gathered in front of uh, Sheriff Up Arpaio's uh, nice. jail Great. and we witnessed and we protested and we organized and so this is just a natural outgrowth of that mm -hmm. and we w wanted to think about how to get the conversation started sure. on immigration sure. and immigration issues and so we thought why don't we do an immigration film festival and so it grew out of that and it's going to be October 24th, 25th, 26th awesome. um, and it's 25 films and all of them are free except for the 25th of October which is going to be our big gala night down at the Gala Theater in Columbia Heights and we're going to be showing who is Diane Crystal and we're going to have a panel discussion it's going to be a nice case reception. Excellent. Um, there is a website that you can go to. And we're going to give the viewers all that information, so don't worry about repeating it. It's going to be sure. on the site. Uh, we'll give the information, all the details, So, but, but yes, it's going to be pretty well attended, I suppose, yeah. right? I do know that from my perspective, um, we're almost completely sold out of tickets wow. at my congregation, okay. the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. Okay. Um, so yeah. So uh, can you hook up a host here? Or? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sure. Okay. So if I may, so thank you, Alex. That was really very helpful. Um, I wanted to offer two more things, um, and I wanted to pick up on what you had said about the now, conversation. In your capacity, your role? Sure. So I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Greater Washington Immigration Film Festival. A couple of things I wanted to pick up on, I think it's the conversation piece. I think that, again, we as I mentioned, like immigration is a complex issue, and I think that when we identify, when we identify people as people, and, and I talk about that in terms of like if we think about what's going on in Syria, I think it's overwhelming to Americans, to anyone, to think about sort of a humanitarian crisis on such a large scale. But seeing mm -hmm. seeing individuals and the terrible, terrible beheadings, I think we it, it's it's, a, it's powerful. Like mm -hmm. you know. It, as individuals, we tend to grab on to something that we can sort of hold a little closer. Mm -hmm. And so these film festivals are really intended to have people see immigration through the view, through the eyes of, 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 of a few, of a handful. Sure. Um, that can certainly be a spread to many more people in terms of, that, you know, we're going to see in who is Diane Cristal, uh, Cristal um, a gentleman who crossed the border from Honduras, um, who ended up dying in the desert, and that is the gala event, as you mentioned. Um, and I, I, it, becomes, it, it becomes something that we can identify with. Mm -hmm. And all the films, and there are 13 films. There are 13 films over four days. The 23rd, we're doing a uh, we're doing a, an extra another show mm -hmm. at the Silver Spring Revels. And I'm thanks, so glad you mentioned the website, and I'm glad that you'll put it up later on. Mm -hmm. But um, these are really powerful films. They're all free, uh, with the exception of the gala film, which is in D.C. at the at the Hispanic uh, Gala Theater. Mm -hmm. And it's just an exciting opportunity just to to, to see immigration uh, through. Um, <sighs> It's a more narrow eyes. but yeah. broader perspective sure. at the same time. And I think that that's the important why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, it's important for people to understand why that's right. these folks give up everything. That's right. They give up their family, their language, right. their home. Why are they doing it? Mm -hmm. That's right. They're not coming here to be lazy, unmotivated, right. and a drain on the society, that's right. right? That's right. I mean, it takes quite the individual, that's right. quite the strength 
to pick up and move to and a foreign country. It's almost like when you see someone on the metro who's making a lot of noise, like you associate, we would liken it to travel, when we travel abroad, you know, the, the, the loud American is, always, is the American that sort of, that you think represents everybody. But the reality is that on that same metro train, there are 100 people traveling that come from our country that, that are respectful and kind and decent sure. and, that, and follow the kind of customs and norms. Sure. And I think that's sort of, I think that's what we see in, in, in any kind of stereotype, any kind of stereotyping. It's you know, interesting you say that. I had a friend just tell me that um, they were over in uh, Japan mm -hmm. and getting on the plane was this loud, he called American, mm -hmm. on his cell phone. And he was complaining, why do you all Americans do that? That's right. I'm like, wait a second, that, that's, that's some rude person that's right. having no regard for his, his fellow human beings, having that obnoxious conversation. To your point, there's a lot of different perspectives out there that are wrong about the immigrant community. That's right. And one of the films that we're going to be showing um, is called The Other Side of Immigration. And mm -hmm. um, it speaks directly to that issue of why would people be willing to risk no. their lives and no. their families no. to no. cross the border mm -hmm. in the desert and the heat and that sort of thing. That's so, amazing. That's yeah. great. Yeah. These are very, very cool documentaries. Yeah. And we have one that's going to be on sci-fi. It's a sci-fi sci kind of film. So you've got a lot of different people. Really? Um, that will be attracted to this kind of thing. It's happening all throughout DC, Virginia, and Maryland at the um, Ethical Society in DC, mm -hmm. at Casa de Maryland in Hyattsville. It's gonna be happening at several Unitarian Universalist churches yeah. in Fairfax, in Mount Vernon, Montgomery in Silver College. Spring, mm -hmm. Montgomery College, right. So. I, I think what's amazing, and um, I don't know if people understand the impact, and it's not unique to Latinos, it's not unique to one group or another, and it's very much true with Americans. When you hear, I was the first in my family That's to right. go to college. That's mm -hmm. right. I mean, how many times have you heard that? And mm -hmm. there's a sense of achievement, mm -hmm. of pride or accomplishment of the American dream. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right, because in other countries, it's only the privileged That's right. that get educated. That's right. You know, if, you, if you're from a, a, a coal mine state, mm -hmm. if you're from a motor town state, if you're from these lower economic areas, it's not a given that you go on to higher education. That's right. right. And, and that's what people that come here want. They want the same opportunities, mm -hmm. and they're willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. They're willing to do their do. Their due. And I, I just, I don't run into a lot of people that just want to come here and hang out and do that's nothing. Right. No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that people leave their countries with a great heavy heart, mm -hmm. but they do it whether to to, to, to provide health care, to provide um, food and resources to their families where they're left at home. Mm -hmm. But they come to the United States seeking opportunity, seeking to contribute. Do people get sick? Yes. Do they use mm -hmm. the health care system? Yes. Do they get hit by cars? Yes. I mean, like, that, that could be any one of us. Sure. Um, we, but they, they come not to be a dream, but to be an asset. I mean, I think that the idea of the American dream, it resonates so deeply with so many of us, you know, I, mean, I said that half my family were immigrants because I've mm -hmm. married into a family that I consider my own. You know, that they came to the United States thinking that this was an opportunity to better themselves and sure. to contribute to a community. I know it, it's sort of I liken it to being on a solar grid. You know, like mm -hmm. you, know, you, 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 you take the energy and you feed back to the grid. That um, that you that you, you support yourself and you give back. You know, yeah. and I, I think it's I think it's very powerful what we have to offer. It, in well, the it's, it's symbiotic. Right? right? I mean, we, we take, we give. And from my religious background as a Unitarian Universalist, this Immigration Film Festival speaks to me because we have several principles that we keep um, in mind. Um, mm -hmm. And of the seven principles that we keep in mind, um, the, the first is the inherent worth and dignity That's of right. all human beings. Okay. And so these film festivals um, highlight that everyone who's coming has inherent worth and dignity. Right. And the other principle that I is brought to mind for me is the um, interconnectedness of all of existence right. and how interconnected I am even though my mom did come here legally even though you know the the undocumented story isn't my story I'm still connected to the sure. children who are crossing the That's border right. so it's well you don't view them sorry you don't view them as those people no that's right right and I think that's where some of this yes. Fear starts. Right. That's right. That they're they're somehow different and, right. and almost subhuman. Right. Uh, because they they don't speak my language, or I That's don't right. know that food that they're eating, or right. it, it just sounds different. That's 
That's right. right. I think it's the ability to connect with people. I think that the language sometimes can be a barrier because people feel like, I can't connect with that person. And these films offer an opportunity to connect with people, to, oh, to connect with the immigration issues, okay. with, the, with what people face, why they face, and, and, to, and to really, and the inherent worth of all people. I think when we stop thinking about people as our, our immigrants as illegal or illegal, illegal or legal, but as people who are coming because out of, out of, out of dire necessity into an, to, 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 to a place where they would hope that there's opportunity for themselves and their families and the communities. I mean, abused is one of the family, is one of the films that we're showing, and it, it so contradicts the idea that you can sort of round them up and send them away. Yeah. The federal infrastructure wasn't there to be able to support the kind of jurisprudence, the kind sure. of uh, uh, legal representation, housing, health care, uh, and it, it doesn't work. See, and, I mean, and, and, and it resulted in a complete and absolute failure of that community. That community, those schools were affected. The churches were affected. Yeah. You know, it, 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 the businesses were affected. It devastated that community. It, it's just not. It's not as simple as round them up and send them away. It's not. It, and it this, this is, we talked about this before. That's a failure of the government, the federal government, doing what they should be doing. That's right. Um, you know, Arizona sort of went haywire. I live in Herndon. There was a previous town council that thought it was okay to possibly stop people that look like me mm -hmm. and ask me for my papers mm -hmm. in America, <laughs> right? I mean, really. Right. And for some people, I think that that's the way we fix the problem. No. But it's, it's a far more complicated problem. And I, I, that's why we were talking about the previous section. Um, it's gonna take a lot of people to come to the table with that's open right. minds. That's right. right. Because it's not an easy solution here. That's right, right. So. So tell us, just in the final few minutes we have here, people can go online, they can right. get the schedule. Okay. What if they're out of town or something? How, I mean, will, ha will the website contain yeah. some information that folks can follow up and, and do more things? We are, an art, we are inherently an arts organization, and we've been thinking about how we want to follow up. I mean, the, the intent is to, start, is to initiate a conversation about sure. these films. And I think what we'd like to do is we'd like to make this more than a one-time event, but sure. we'd like to make this a, a recurring event. So every year, do this kind of festival. So I think if people are interested in these issues, they can certainly reach out to any of the folks that are listed on the website to get more information to, feel, to, to contribute to the film festival. Mm -hmm. We have partners um, that we partner with, uh, organizations throughout the DC metro area um, that help us get the work out about about the festival through their own social media outlets um, if they're not going to be here for the festival but they can spread but they want to contact one of us or contact the festival directors um, their contact information is on the website it's patty abjur and uh, judith johnson but there are ways of getting involved um, whether you're going to be at this at this festival or in future festivals great the other thing is we do have a facebook page that okay. you can go onto facebook and just search greater washington immigration film festival right. do the folks in the in the studio have that information to post or yes. do you want to tell us about it's just a real simple search um, okay. and you can go on to Google and um, just search uh, Greater Washington Immigration Film Festival. We have a website and we also have an Eventbrite site okay. where you can reserve your tickets. Like I said, um, we've got 25 films and 24 of those films are free. Mm -hmm. um, the only one that isn't free and costs $25 is the Who is Diani Crystal. Um, I so still think there's potentially some fundraising capabilities absolutely, here? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> We're always looking for people to um, contribute. If they have the time and the money, we could always use that. Well, ladies, thank you so much You're for coming welcome. on board. Folks, please reach out and uh, I, I, you won't be disappointed. We'll be back. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Oh. 
Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent. Like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. Here again, the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Folks, welcome back. Uh, our last segment, uh, we have a very special guest here. Frank Anderson, he is a grassroots activist for voter restoration. Frank, thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you so much, Cesar. Tell the folks a little bit about yourself and uh, your passion for uh, restoration rights. Well, um, I have a very personal experience that, uh, that brings me into this. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I want to open by thanking you again for bringing me on the show. So this is an important, uh, important issue. Right, and um, a lot of folks may not know this, but in Virginia, it's, it used to be very, very hard to get your rights restored if you have a felony conviction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still fairly hard compared to other states, but it's gotten much, much easier, and you can do it online. But that wasn't always the case. Okay. Now, I myself have a felony conviction from uh, uh, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and I committed a burglary, did my time. And several years later, um, I started getting interested in politics, and I wanted to register to vote. And like many ex-felons, I heard that the process was just too difficult. Mm -hmm. But I finally looked into it, and, and there was an application. So I filled out the application. I tried it. actually got denied the first time. Mm -hmm. And that was when I started to get involved with some advocacy groups and some other folks who were into voter restoration. Uh, and uh, we tried to do something to change the process. Mm -hmm. So it was about five years ago, and it's just amazing how far we've come. Uh, since then, just in five years. Five years. So yeah. under the the administration of Governor, Governor McDonnell, right? It's it's actually improved. Okay. Right. That's actually, good to know. yeah, that was very interesting, and we didn't expect it. However, um, uh, it came around at the beginning of his administration, and uh, now now Governor Kane did did great work as well by okay. uh, calling for. Uh, for everyone to uh, get their rights restored or to submit their applications in time in 2008. And so there was a big influx of people who applied at that point. Okay. But Governor McDonnell had a little slip up in the beginning of his administration uh, where it was accidentally released that they wanted you to write an essay to say why you think you sh your rights should be restored uh, before you could even apply. This is a so just make sure we're all clear on this. So, mm -hmm. so a, a person has um, done a crime. Mm -hmm. Uh, they've done their time. Right. So they have paid their debt to society. Sure, at probation, fines, everything. Th they're done. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're free to go sure. to return to the society. Mm -hmm. And we want them to do more things to prove that they're worthy or uh, help me with that. Right. Well, I mean, some folks who are opposed to restoration of rights uh, feel like that people should do a little more before they're allowed to vote again. Okay. Now, in Virginia, we're kind of a very punitive society mm -hmm. in that um, usually the responses I would hear would say something like, we shouldn't let them vote until they do this or this. They broke the law. They shouldn't be allowed to make the law. But they did their time. Them. Yeah, that's, that was my point. Okay. And my point was, you know, if you've done your time, uh, then basically you, you've done, you've c c fulfilled your sentence. Correct. If somebody thinks you shouldn't be allowed to vote, you're basically your voting rights are continuing to be incarcerated while you're not incarcerated. Sure. sure. So as, in essence, they're disagreeing with the judge. They're saying mm -hmm. uh, the judge's sentence wasn't harsh enough. Right. Just, you need to continue to be punished. Now, I just don't understand that. Now, now how, does, how does that help us with the process? Because some people may not know, mm -hmm. and, and some people probably have a family member, perhaps, or someone they know. Right. Um, you're telling me it's not that difficult. No, you're no. You're telling them. Okay. Right. So it used to be that you had to fill out a long paper application. And, uh, and for some cases, like violent felonies, it still is a 12-page uh, mm -hmm. application. But mm -hmm. today, you can apply online. Now, if you have a nonviolent felony, uh, you can just go to commonwealth.virginia.gov. So not for, for those that mm -hmm. don't know, what does that mean? What is a non 
What does that entail? Is there a, a bunch of lists somewhere? Oh, there is a big list okay. right on the okay. website. It okay. explains exactly what kinds of charges are applicable. Uh, so most violent offenses. Uh, now, I, I heard that that had changed mm -hmm. recently. There were some things that were shifted. So yeah. just at a high level, what, what, did, what did that mean? Um, Right, so it used to be the case that, um, that drug offenses were lumped in with the violent offenses. So if you had a drug so charge, like marijuana, that was distribution, and things like that, okay. other than possession. That's violent and now. That would, yeah, that would have, not anymore, but it used to be lumped together okay. with the violent felonies. Okay. And, and then actually, some of us who were advocating for these changes, uh, finally the governor's office decided basically if it's a, the only kinds of things that aren't applicable for the automatic restoration, which we have now. You know, would be violent felonies, election law, and, and some th this was done under Governor McDonald, right? And okay. and then pr made even better under Governor McAuliffe okay. because uh, because they they perfected the online application. Excellent. Yeah. So it's automatic restoration, but you still have to apply. Okay. Now most states it's automatic at some point. You don't even have to apply for it. So so they they have to apply to validate address to validate I mean right. I, so it'd be like registering so is that really mm -hmm. a burden because they well, can't really put their previous address as you know the local penitentiary or, or jailhouse right right well I mean any address where you're staying it doesn't matter you did, they just need a way to contact you and to send mm -hmm. you your uh, your approval that you've uh, had your rights restored okay okay yeah it's pretty straightforward and as a matter of fact I got a phone call um, uh, from one of a volunteer one of our volunteers and he told me he ran into a guy and I called him today uh, it turns out that he had a felony conviction from, from 1979, and all this time he really? thought that it was impossible to apply. So, an individual living in Virginia? Yeah, yeah, wow. right here in Fairfax County. Wow. And he he tried uh, he submitted his paperwork some years ago, and nothing happened, and uh, so he was just really frustrated. You know, uh, you can understand wow. why. You know, he's yeah. tried, he's been through the system, and now he's having a hard time mm -hmm. getting on with his life. Uh, and he wants to apply for jobs, but when you apply for jobs, the applications <clears throat> often say, you know, have you ever had a felony conviction? Sure. And uh, one thing that I always tell people is that if you get your uh, rights restored, you get to have a paper that's from the governor's office saying, we think this guy is okay. And you can present that if you're applying for a job. Wow. You know, my rights were restored. So, you know, please don't well, think that I'm just a, you know, a criminal, right? Right. So uh, it's really uh, come a long way. Uh, the process is now available online. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really great that, that this is available now. So what, what still, there's some hurdles. Mm -hmm. So what's the most frustrating of those hurdles for you? I mean, just as an activist. Well, I think it's getting the word out. Okay. Um, because, uh, because there's been so many changes it used to be a certain kind of application, and then the application itself had changed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so people may not know that it's even available. Mm -hmm. uh, another hurdle is is um, now. Now, who's? I don't want to place blame, mm -hmm. but where should that outreach or communication be coming from? Well, it should, I believe, come from from uh, from the governor's office, and they mm -hmm. are. You know, they're mm -hmm. doing what they can. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I think. Community organizations, churches. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the forms, the process, mm -hmm. it's there. We just have to get people like yourself, right? Clone you, <laughs> and send people out to spread the word. Sure, because you know, how do you find people like right. that, that need to get their rights restored? So mm -hmm. for some folks, it's a way in their past. Some mm -hmm. folks don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a touchy issue for some people. Mm -hmm. But but any, I just would like everybody to know that, that um, now nowadays the governor's office is doing everything they can to process these applications as fast as they can. That's great. And you know they want to get them in on time before uh, before the voter registration deadline, which mm -hmm. is October fourteenth. So they're working around the clock. So we're a couple weeks away. Yeah. So where where can people go if they have issues or they know family that mm -hmm. have issues? Where can they go today? to start the process? They can go to commonwealth.virginia.gov. Okay, and we're, we're gonna put this up uh -huh. uh, so everyone has, so commonwealth.virginia.gov. Right, that is the Secretary of the Commonwealth's office. They're okay. in charge of restoration of rights. Okay. And you apply there, and all the information is up there, how to apply, whether or not you're eligible, you know, what kind of application you need to use. It's all there on the site, and you can call mm -hmm. them. So that's where I would direct people to go. I don't wanna be a gatekeeper no. being the only guy, the go-to <laughs> guy for, you know, and by no means am I the only. There's a lot of organizations we've been working with, right. NAACP, League of Women Voters, uh, Virginia Interfaith. Uh, there's so many groups that have come forward to, to try to, That's you know, great. push this agenda. That's great. 
Now in the future, um, we want to uh, actually change the Virginia Constitution so that it doesn't have to be just the governor's office that can restore rights. Yeah, that seems like a, a, a big, I don't want to say funnel, but it, it seems mm -hmm. that it's not a very efficient process. Right, not at all, and that's, that was by design. You know, when they, when they wrote the Virginia Constitution, felon disenfranchisement, it's been there for a long, long time. Uh, uh, the, but the most recent, recent version of, the, of this part of the Constitution was drafted in 1902, okay. and it was specifically designed to disenfranchise certain people. Well, wow. uh, do you have any numbers of the estimated number of folks that are eligible that are not? It's uh, estimated allowed? about 300,000 in Virginia. In Virginia? Yeah. 300,000. Right, that may have felony convictions and have not yet gotten their rights restored. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that is a huge number. Mm -hmm. That sways elections. Sure, that can make all the difference. Wow. Wow. Um, just briefly, we've got a few minutes here, but I, I want people to kind of get to know you a little bit more in terms of what it meant for you to get that right back. What, what did it mean to you, your family, you know, as a person? What did getting that right mean? You know, do and mean for you? Well, it was really um, getting this in the mail. It was one of the most thrilling days of my life because, you know, when I got this certificate with a gold seal on it, with a sign by the governor, it said my rights were restored. I was a mm -hmm. very happy man uh, mm -hmm. because it was not only was it a validation of, uh, you know, myself and, you know, restoring some of my dignity, and, and, and uh, it was also the culmination of some of the work that I've been doing to try to get to move this thing forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as I got that, I actually went and registered to vote. Uh, that very same day, so because I couldn't wait. Wow! What what year? May I ask what year that was? That was two thousand and ten. Really? And and you had not had the right to vote for? Well, um, not since nineteen ninety eight when okay. I was convicted. Except oh. for when I lived in Washington D.C., where the rules are different. I could vote mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. but in Virginia, no. Wow! Well, wow! Well. Yeah. Well, what um, what is your biggest hope then? Uh, outside of uh, the constitutional change and and some of these things, I just I just want to leave people with the parting thought. I mean, what is the the easiest way they can help spread the word and just, I mean, what can they do to kind of help spread this thing a little bit more? I think that whenever anybody is thinking about politics, mm -hmm. thinking about voting, which mm -hmm. you know around here especially we talk about it a lot. Yeah. Every year but, we have an election. But, Keep in mind that, that uh, you can just bring it up, bring up the fact that, you, hey, not everybody can vote yet, mm -hmm. but you can change that. So Make it part of the message. Yeah, part of the conversation sure. about voting is because mm -hmm. that's, you know, this is a potential part It's a nonpartisan issue. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That, and I think we can uh, make that happen with a few folks. What do you think? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Frank, let me tell you, it has been an absolute, absolute pleasure having you on. I know Appreciate this is a huge issue. Um, I, I've, I've heard a couple things new mm -hmm. from you tonight, and we've known each other for a while. But I tell you, the work that you're doing, uh, the work that people like yourself are doing, um, it's going to give people that dignity that, that you talked about. So I think this is very important. Appreciate thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Folks, and um, thank you for joining us this evening. We're going to be doing a lot of these uh, grassroots uh, issues, you'll be hearing from folks directly that are impacted and involved. So we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us.